Good evening and welcome to part five in our course Being With. Tonight we look at the subject of Bible or the Scriptures. Last week we looked at the church and those two belong together. Uh, when you think about literary inventions, things that are people write or tell, uh, you can think in terms of three different types or three different genres. First of all, you have what might be called epics. Those are the grand stories that we end well. Uh, think of Homer, the Iliad or the Odyssey. Think of Tolstoy's War and Peace. Think of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. They tell a huge overarching narrative in which there are lots of characters maybe even nations and cultures and, and a long vista of history. And we find ourselves involved as small part actors within that overarching epic. Um, then you can think also of a second type, which is a lyric. And, and lyrics are more subjective. You describe your thoughts, your moods, your feelings. It's about how you respond and react to the things that are going on around you. But a lot of it is about looking within and describing the landscape of your inner being, so to speak. So you've got the objective epic, which is grander than you, far grander, and also the lyric, which is really about you and how you interact and feel and respond. But if you want to take those two together in probably the most classic type of communication, you're talking about a drama. Think about Shakespeare's plays. A drama brings together the objective facts, the things that happen in human history and beyond, and also the lyric, which is how I feel subjectively and what I think uh, about my inner being. So the outer and the inner come together in this great um, uh, drama, which includes participants and actors and their feelings and, and their motives. All of that wrapped, gloriously wrapped together. And that's probably the best description of what the Bible is. The Bible is not just an epic and not just a lyric. It is a drama, a bit like a Shakespearean drama though the Bible came first. And if you think of it in those terms, there are probably, you can probably think of it a wee bit like a Shakespearean play as a five act drama. And I know we looked at this back in the springtime and the summer when I looked at uh, this course in a different way or a similar course, but it's, it's, it bears repeating, I think tonight, within the overarching framework of the Being With series. So the Bible is a five act drama. Act one is creation. In fact, you have to go back behind creation. What's the purpose, the why of creation and the who? It's God, Father, Son and Spirit who creates something other than God because God wants to lavish that love and life and, and glory that God is and not just share it between Father, Son and Spirit but to share it with something else, something other, a universe, creation, planet Earth, humanity, you and I. So God creates and lavishes, almost like a, a fountain that overflows and, 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 and showers goodness and glory and, and wonder in creation. And that's where we find our place. So creation comes first. God creates. And the reason is that God wants to create just in a sense because God glor gl glories in that and wants to en others to enjoy the glory that God is and that God therefore gives. If you look back to the first question of our uh, subordinate standards, uh, the shorter catechism, there's a great question and answer. What is man's chief end or what is our chief end as human beings? And the answer is our chief end, our chief purpose is to glorify God and enjoy God forever. And the purpose, the main purpose for, for us being and for creation being is so that God could create and lavish and share that love and that glory and the life with us. And that we would benefit from that, having our being and our well-being from the God who creates. And it's not just Genesis chapters 1 and 2. Creation is also evoked in the book of Job. It's evoked in John chapter 1. It's evoked in Hebrews chapter 1 and also in Colossians chapter 1. So it's important to remember the creation narrative, the creation story, so to speak, the drama that unfolds and begins at creation is not just in Genesis, but elsewhere too. And it's important to read the Bible with those various different strands interwoven, speaking about creation. Act two is Israel. 
God doesn't just lavish life and love upon us and all creation. God also wants to give a sense of purpose and, and, and shape the story and shape the unfolding drama and give us a purpose, a direction, to give us certain structures uh, so that we're not just, in a sense, left to freely roam the earth and do whatever we please, either by chance discovery or because we find that certain things benefit me or us but perhaps don't benefit others as well. So God decides to do that by choosing one particular people, Israel, first of all through Abraham, or Abraham at the time, and his wife Sarah, an old barren couple, and it seems that their creative powers are exhausted. Uh, they seem to be beyond the, the point and age of bearing children and having uh, uh, future inheritors. But God blesses them so that they will be as numerous as the sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky, a beautiful, evocative, poetic way of saying that God's continuing creation will now be focused in Israel, who start off as a small people, probably in numerical terms, remain a small people, but as they grow and as they're liberated and as they found their own nation in the promised land of Israel, of Palestine, the two northern and southern kingdoms, God begins to shape them through the Ten Commandments, through other laws and regulations, a particular ethic and ethos. In other words, a way of life that reflects something of God's purposes and God's inner being. And, and the story of Israel, the story that the Old Testament tells, is a very sprawling drama or narrative. It's about a God who loves us and has to continually uh, challenge us and discipline us, but always with the ends of love and of that covenant, that promise that is given and kept and when we break the covenant when we break God's promises when we break God's heart God because of God's internal nature of being full of grace and love and purpose and forgiveness as well as justice and holiness and righteousness God always uh, acts in ways that will bring us back to our senses and bring us back to God and bring us to community with each other once more so it's important to remember that Israel is a story of a God who loves us and will never let us go. And when we let go of God and stray and go far away on our own devices, our own pathways, God always calls us back. But it's a painful story both ways. and It's almost as if we can't live with God and can't live without God. And in that sort of mix and muddle, the story of Israel and God's love for Israel, God's covenant with Israel continues to weave its way. God brings that to a, a kind of culmination in Jesus, who is the summing up of creation and of God's covenant. Jesus is the centre of the story. He's the third act of the drama. And this is the heart and soul. This is where the character and being of God is fully revealed and not just revealed, but embodied. Uh, so he is the son of God eternally with the father and also with the spirit. So he's fully divine. He's the creator become a creature. But he is also, in ways that we can state but not fully understand, he's also um, the creature come to its fulfillment. He is the son of man. He is the embodiment of perfectly intended humanity. And he embodies those two realities within him. The church can state it in certain doctrines and creeds, uh, but th there's a richness that escapes our doctrines and our language uh, and, and our logic. And Jesus is the centre of the story. And God's purposes come to the, the, a climax in Jesus' ministry, his mission, particularly his passion and his crucifixion, where he reveals the full extent of God's love and God holding on to us in love in Jesus but also Jesus' story and his passion and his betrayal, his death, uh, reveals the full extent of human wrongdoing and human sin. Even the people who intend best for Jesus, his followers, fall away and fail. And it's obvious that the other participants in the drama, the story, uh, expose the full range of human sin. But the resurrection, in a sense, is is proof positive of the fact that God comes to reconcile and redeem the world in Jesus Christ. And so the story continues. And the story continues into Act 4, where we now come on board as the church, 
the church that has been in existence for 2,000 years, those who follow Jesus Christ and who are would be faithful disciples and followers but often fail and are always enmeshed in sin and are full of that sense of simultaneously good and bad, righteous and unrighteous, holy and profane as we've looked at before. But God continues through the risen Christ, the ascended Christ, and now the giving of the Holy Spirit especially to shape the the life, the mission, the ministry, the, the, the purpose of the church and its life, bearing witness to God's love in Jesus Christ. And that's where we find ourselves as followers of Jesus Christ in our time and place, 2,000 years on and still continuing. And what we still await and move towards is Act 5, which is the end or the eschaton, which means the last thing or the last things. And that will be the fulfilment, the culmination, the climax, or the consummation of all that has gone before. And the great thing about the Christian narrative or drama is that the face that we find on the throne of the universe, when all will be revealed and all will be put right and restored, that end the person who bears a f- his face on the throne, the risen, ascended, glorified Christ, is the same Jesus, the same Christ that we met on the cross. Uh, and the passion and the agony of that uh, is also matched with the glory and the, the triumph uh, and, the, and the infinite glory of what's yet to come uh, when we see face to face Christ on the throne. So that's the five-act drama that gives our lives shape and direction and purpose and hope and meaning. There are probably two mistakes that happen in life. The first mistake is that people don't know that drama, that story at all with its five acts. They don't know about creation. They don't know about God's covenant with Israel. They don't know about God coming to us supremely in Jesus Christ as the centre of the story, act three. They don't know about the church or ignore the church, the fact that the church embodies what God in Christ is and does. And they don't have a clear purpose about what the, the, the direction of it all is, eschaton, glory, uh, consummation, a coming kingdom, a new creation, eternal life. So we create our own being, we think we're our own self-made people, and we try to just squeeze in whatever content whatever things, whatever joy, whatever possessions we have and and what will be one life and then that's it, we'll be snuffed out and that's our story gone. Um, Ecclesiastes in the Bible reflects that bleakness when it says, let us eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. Uh, There's no prospect of life in the round, eternal life through God and the risen Christ. The other mistake we can make, and this is the mistake that people within the church make, is that we mistake our place in the story for somewhere that's the wrong place. We're now in Act 4. Creation has happened. Israel has happened and continues. Indeed, creation continues too. And Jesus has occurred. All those things happened without us lifting a finger. We had nothing to do with them. They were given as gifts and we benefit from them. We stand on their shoulders, so to speak. So we're in Act 4, and all the great things have been done. Creation, providence, governance, redemption, reconciliation, salvation. All of that has been done. That is gift. It is given and offered afresh each and every second of your life. So you don't have to rest the weight of the universe on your shoulders. It's been done. You simply accept it and live with it and try to share and perpetuate the grace and the love of God in Jesus Christ. So take that weight off your shoulder and live in the time between the third act and the fifth act, because the best is yet to come and the best is guaranteed to be. So we act in Act 4, perhaps still as part of the early church. The church has been going for 2,000 years, and we think that's an enormously long time, and it is, but The church may well be in existence for millennia and millennia and millennia yet to come. We may yet be in an early phase of the church. So not everything is set in stone, though we stand on strong foundations. And our lives have been shaped uh, to uh, the, the glorious end in Jesus Christ, the risen, ascended, returning Christ. But in the meantime, we have plenty to give thanks for, but plenty to get on with. 
let's not presume that we have to do it all and let's not presume that God hasn't given us that much because he has. And in our life as the church, he's given us the scriptures, he's given us each other, he's given us tradition, the church's history in the past, he's given us baptism, he's given us the Lord's Supper, he's given us the gift of prayer, the gift of praise, the gift of so many things, focused in worship but lived outside the church, the church's premises too, in the round of life. So let's give thanks for the Bible and its five-act drama, creation, Israel, Jesus, church and eschaton, and give thanks that the great things have been done and great things have yet to be done, and within that we find our place, our purpose and our meaning. Thanks for tuning in and we'll look next week at a further aspect of being with.